Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Profiles in Risk. I am your host, Nick Lamparelli. Uh, it's Friday afternoon. Uh, it, David and I, as you can see on the screen, are already talking about dinner, but I am very pleased uh, to end my Friday, end my week, to have this conversation with David Wald. David is the co-founder and CEO of A Claimant, and we're going to go uh, very much into in-depth into uh, InsureTech on claims, which is uh, very hot, very necessary. And on this uh, Friday afternoon, David, thanks for taking time out of your schedule to talk to us. Well, hey, no, thank you very much for having me. Super excited to be here. Good, awesome, awesome. Um, I, I start out every episode by giving the guest um, opportunity for an elevator pitch. What is a claimant? Great, uh, great question. Um, so. Uh, at a claim that we have a core belief, uh, and it's that every company has the right to be a better risk. Um, so what we've done uh, is actually built workflow tools uh, to make it easier for companies to be just that. So we digitize everything from workplace safety, incident claims management, the associated data all into one simple platform, because in our opinion, there's no reason managing all these things it needs to be so complicated and most importantly, so paper-based. And our chance here is to help every company do a better job of making it a digital environment, get better results, create happier employees, customers, and happier people who watch the bottom line. And if we do that, we're doing our job. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So every, every time, uh, there are so many uh, startups in this air and in, in insurance. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm always fascinated by rewinding the tape and trying to figure out how did it start? Yep. When did the light bulb go off in your head? that said, there is something underserved here. Um, no one seems to be solving that problem. I'm, I'm gonna take the leap of faith, I'm going to do it. Walk us through the calculus of how this all happened. Um, I'll be honest, I'll say it's a lot less calculus and a lot more uh, tornado. Um, <laughs> but here's kind of how the story goes. And uh, because it's more fun, we'll give you the unfiltered version. So the full story goes, um, about uh, 2013, um, I was working at a venture fund in Chicago. Um, my family friends knew me as a tech guy because I was working with the guy who started Groupon. Um, and so that was a natural mm -hmm. jump. Um, uh, at the time, the girl who I was dating's father, um, it's always a good part of the story, right? <laughs> uh, was running a work comp captive in the staffing industry. And he kept asking me why he had to own a fax machine to get claims filed when he can get Uber on his phone. Um, and so uh, in kind of a, a never ending spiral of shame, at the time I told him I have no interest in insurance. I'm focused on tech, like not for me. Um, and as you can imagine, based on the conversation we're having today, um, over time, got more and more interested in the conversation over many, many beers over years. Um, finally got to the point where we're like, okay, let's, let's build an app. So 2013, 2013, we loop in a fourth person, um, our CTO, Joel Friedman, build an app in about six months. Um, thought it was very simple. It was uh, to make it easier to report a claim, better things will happen. So we put a button on a phone that said report an incident. Done in about 180 days, right? January 1st to about the middle of the summer. When it was done, um, this is now 2014, this is still a little bit before InsureTech became a thing. It, we were just kind of a tech company that was dabbling around insurance. Um, we managed to get a couple of meetings with companies that were way above our punching weight. So we talked with the guys that ran um, Risk at CNA, uh, at Kelly Services, um, and the guy who ran Risk for the Navy's Fleet Readiness Centers. Mm -hmm. um, I still have no idea how we got the meetings, um, but we showed them this app on the phone, and my expectation was it'd be like, whatever and the response was oh my god this is incredible and that was like the first moment we were like oh my god what's what's happening here why is this reaction this reaction and from there it just kind of kept snowballing we dug in further we realized the problem wasn't just about reporting it was this whole risk management function that's kind of the underlying backbone of everything relating to insurance is just underserved and candidly operating in an archaic environment and next thing you know we have a claim okay so uh the the first app uh, that was for auto? Uh, work comp. Work comp. Okay. Oh. So that, that, that now I can see why the reaction would be as big as it is because that's a very underserved market. 100%. So all things commercial property and casual is where we focus, but it's this amazing thing that 
as far as things have gotten along and the advancement of um, personal auto, property, health, even life, um, the commercial property and casualty side lags so much further behind those other facets. And those facets lag so far behind just general industry tech, um, which creates this huge kind of like drag. And especially considering how much of an impact these have on businesses, both profitability, the effectiveness of people that are involved in the processes and the actual amount of dollars that are being spent in these areas. Um, we kind of realized, oh my God, we're in this giant black hole. That's a great opportunity if we can find a way to solve the problem the right way. Okay. So let's do the um, before and after for your customer. Mm -hmm. um, we, we sort of know the after, although I, I would like you to walk through how that actually works. Yeah. What did it, the before, was it literally someone would get hurt? And they'd have to report it to someone, and it sort of, and then you, and then there's a fax machine, and so yeah. it could it could literally take days for someone to report back or figure out, hey, we heard you were hurt, what's wrong? So if it's like a severe injury, um, there's no guidance for that person or or delayed guidance, um, which makes the claim worse makes uh, makes the claimant ups, uh, upset that no yeah. one's taking care of them. Do I have the before correct? It, it, do, do you want do you want to throw any more vinegar on that wound? Yeah, it's so it's unbelievable. It's not days. It's normally weeks. Um, so the biggest stat that everyone's proud of in work comp is how many of their claims are reported in less than a week. So that 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 that's a good thing. And the answer <laughs> for most companies is anywhere between. 70 and 75% if they're doing their job correctly, although it's actually, if you factor everything in, it's probably a little bit less. Um, but these things just linger. And a lot of the reasons they linger is because when someone gets hurt, the supervisor or the branch manager has to go find the form they got from the last offsite. And that thing is either completed, faxed, scanned, it's dropped into an Excel file somewhere. They're waiting for someone to follow up. They don't know who to call, or they're just their, their primary response, I'm just gonna call the home office and say, hey, I got hurt, and then hopefully that person routes him to the right place. So you're basically trying to say, hey, here's this process that's supporting this 100,000, million, 10 million, 20 million dollar a year spend we have on our claims, but the process we have in place to support it is non-existent. And then once those things happen, the person who's trying to manage those files, even in companies that are sophisticated, like some Fortune 50, Fortune 70, that do things that border on tech, still have people who are dropping these things in a sophisticated environment into basically Microsoft Access. In unsophisticated, it's in somebody's email, in their Outlook, in Excel doc, in SharePoint. Paper folders um, are not uncommon. Um, and this folder, it, it, it blows my mind that like that's the environment that's supporting this hopefully huge insure tech movement is still sitting on basically a bunch of rubble as a foundation. What do you think is your rough estimate in terms of how much extra cost and expense adds on to a claim mm -hmm. because it doesn't because it is delayed yeah so um the best test that we have to go off of um osha hartford a bunch of people have done studies the rough math that we've seen is it's about 10 percent a week for every week that is delayed okay uh, every month it's delayed i believe the actual cost including indemnity doubles give or take wow Okay, so if, if things don't get resolved within a month, you've essentially doubled roughly um, the claim and the expense. So that can build quickly mm -hmm. if that is scaled across uh, multiple offices, potentially hundreds of different employees that have some probability of mm -hmm. loss. Okay, so the, the numbers start working in your favor for a value proposition as a tech solution you can you can sort of quantify and say listen you need to instill something here to sh really shrink that down because it's it's you know for for um for some companies they'll look at it like well that's the insurance company's problem mm -hmm. but at the end of the day there's the their that claim ends up showing up in your premium somewhere down the road but, and that I think has been the biggest difference that even talking about before and after in the past two or three years, there's been this general understanding around risk and insurance where people used to say things like, 
oh, my broker does that, my carrier does that. But at the end of the day, what it comes down to is your carrier or your TPA isn't really managing risk. Their, their job is to adjudicate the claim. That's what you pay them to do. They, you pay them to pay your claim and walk through all the legal processes. They have some controls in place to mitigate fraud and risk, but what people don't realize or haven't realized historically was that everything they do, every decision they make, they make directly impacts the cost of a claim and the spiraling costs related to that around things like replacement labor and time lost and retraining, getting someone back to work. Um, and so there's kind of this exponential effect of what the decisions people make are. And so over the past few years, the mindset has begun to shift from people saying, oh, my carrier does that. If we go ahead and call, we get introduced or my broker. And now they say, I need a better way to get in front of my risk because I don't know how to do it. And that's where I think we've seen a shift in the past even 18 months where people are starting to recognize if I do this, it's hugely valuable all across my organization. And I can help enable that by getting rid of all the administrative nonsense using a technology solution to reinforce mm -hmm. good process. Yeah. Uh, so is your customer the, uh, the, the actual corporation or is your customer the insurance company and or both? Yeah. So um, we think our user is the corporation primarily, the employer, the policyholder. Secondarily, we also have brokers who are using our solution to help uh, manage their internal team. Some brokers, as they get larger, will start to uh, bring in value added uh, team members to do things like claims advocacy, loss control, risk management, and so on. And they need a place to live because they have the same amount of problems as policyholders that are doing it outsourced for 100 or 200 or 500 of them. And that paperwork is insane. So primary user, policyholder, secondary user uh, is the broker. And then for us, carriers and TPAs are actually more channel partners and endorsers. So for us, we have some carriers who have endorsed us and TPAs who have endorsed us um, because their, their view is very simply, if I can get more data more accurately, quicker for my policyholders, and they're doing a better job of staying on top of it, that is exactly the kind of company I want to insure because those are the ones who are actually going to watch the, the loss ratios here and be better results in, in, in the aggregate. Okay. So, um, is what about usage rate? So yeah. reporting in this incident, does every employee need to have it on their phone? Is it the risk manager? How, how does, how does that part work? Yeah, great question. And so for us, there's still this little bit of a contentious environment that exists. So we're in industries that are primarily blue collar and gray collar things like construction, staffing, municipality, hospitality, and so on. Very often as a risk mitigation technique, most of the time people will have employees report up to their supervisors. And for us, the supervisor is that kick up the point, the person who will uh, report it in. Um, for us, we built the system to kind of be agnostic as to who that front end is, but I would say 90% of our user base is reporting through supervisor. 10% is having employees report direct. And of that 10%, a portion of them are also actually using things like nurse case triage lines. We'll have that person call a nurse triage line, speak to a registered nurse, that information then flows to the API into our system and it kicks the process off for supervisor or the corporate risk manager to then move real data in real time. Yeah. Uh, did you think back then that you would become this much of an expert at workers' compensation? I thought there was no chance in the <laughs> world. Um, okay. in, yeah, unbelievable. Um, uh, beyond workers' comp, yep. is your system usable uh, for general property and casualty? Yep. So right now we are currently being utilized across and beyond the entire commercial property uh, and casualty portfolio. So for us, based on our industries, again, construction, staffing, manufacturing, logistics, we have a good deal of work comp, commercial auto, commercial property, and general liability. Um, but even outside of those four big categories, people are also using us for things like incident only, near hits and near misses, things that may not hit an actual coverage line, like theft. Um, we also work in nursing homes. That is one of the big issues there when you have someone call and say, hey, Alex just stole my purse. And you say, I didn't steal the purse. I have, to do I have to document it somewhere, but it's, it's a real thing. I hit that line. And then the last piece is then even something out into safety. So we do some of the transactional safety work too, because for us, it's the same basic process. I'm going, I'm doing something, I'm documenting it, I'm working through a series of steps. We're talking about things like 
observations, audits, inspections, again, all on that same platform. Employee has another phone, pulls it out, walks the process, all kind of flows back into one system. I, I, you got to watch out for that guy, Alex. He is everywhere. He's Hopefully. everywhere and he's dangerous. Uh, that's an inside joke for those that are listening. <laughs> um, so it, near misses. Um, I, I, to me, that's like incredibly important, um, mostly because it's another data point that that's, mm -hmm. uh, could potentially lead to future claims. Um, how much do you think near misses do get reported? If, uh, uh, how much do, how much do they not? Yeah. So the craziest thing that we find is there's probably two levels of that question. One is how often are they reported? Second one is how often are they reported in any way that provides any kind of meaningful data? And so what we're finding right now is even things like, especially in places like construction and manufacturing, um, staffing, there are so many paper forms that get filled out like, oh, near miss, drop it in the form, drop it in the bucket. And then you say, what happens to those? And the answer is actually that they're all sitting in somebody's office somewhere in these giant boxes. And the reality is no one's digitizing all those things. I think, I think to your point, there's um, the question of saying how can these things actually be used? Should they be used? I think most people actually want near hits and their misses reported as often as possible. A lot of people have put rudimentary practices in place, but they haven't made it easy enough to do. Um, and so for us, we're finding in terms of the usage, that's a great one because it's actually a win for both of the employee to be engaged, supervisor to be engaged, the company know about what's happening. The rough stats we've heard are something like near hit and miss to actual incident is about 30 to one ratio. So every time you have 30 near hits or misses, you will have one incident. So in terms of having data, 30 times more if you get those things reported. But the best thing is if you get those things reported and you're able to actually take proactive action to say, oh my God, three people oh my God, got crushed in this corner by a forklift, maybe we should put a mirror over there. Um, you can actually begin to mitigate some of those things because the reality is if you wait for something to go wrong, it's too late. It reminds me, for, for those that are listening, how valuable uh, near misreporting is. Uh, think of World War II um, <laughs> when, the, when the planes would land, uh, you know, from bombing runs, the engineers would scour the planes and they figured out that, okay, well, this plane survived and look at all the gunshot holes and the flak holes in here. Uh, those those are the areas where they're being hit, but it's not affecting the plane. That means the ones that are crashing, it must be hitting the other areas. So they were able to sort of piece together, make the plane stronger and better. They knew where to add extra armor and where not to add extra armor because yeah. of the near misses. 100%. So it's such a, such a valuable data point that I think a lot of people miss, um, but it, it, can, it can give you a lot of information. Um, so continuing on, um, I, I'm just like completely fascinated because first of all, you were skeptical coming in. Um, have you, have you seen the bar? I know eight claimants raising the bar. Of course. But it's my experience that the bar has not still has not been raised very much at all. So, um, what are you seeing out there in general in terms of the insurance sphere, the ecosystem, um, in terms of the, 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 companies you're interacting with or, you know, um, or at, a, you know, they're at a vantage point. How, how do you feel the industry has be, uh, been able to acclimate to all of this new technology that's coming in? Sometimes I feel like they're choking, but sometimes I feel like it's actually gaining some traction. Yeah, it, and the answer is both. Um, they are choking, the traction is being gained. Um, there's two real interesting things happening here at exactly the same time. Um, the insurance industry, so talking about that, I'm saying uh, carriers, TPAs, and brokers, um, right now are uh, drinking from fire hoses because there's so many advanced, like they're trying to basically jump about 15 years in technology in one um, or two. So you're seeing both the advent of AI, drones, sensors, all different kinds of uh, technology solutions to automate every different part of the process. And they're trying to figure out which of these things are value added, which are not. Um, and then also trying to figure out how is my core business actually gonna be affected by these things? Is it, is it gonna cannibalize it or is it gonna enhance it? And I think the answer is they don't know yet. And so we're seeing basically most people that are kind of in the traditional uh, insurance industry are basically taking a flag, sticking to the ground saying, all right, we're gonna focus on construction wearables. We're gonna focus on 
automating process is not underwriting. Like they're picking one or two things, doing those first and waiting to see what happens. The problem is everything is moving so fast. I'm very curious to actually see which of these things stick around. Um, on the flip side, from the actual companies themselves, um, so the employer base, the, the policyholders, there's kind of this other problem, which is they are being inundated right now with so many different technology solutions. Yeah. And it's not insurance related. It's just in general, you're seeing the automation of tons of processes, the advancement of tons of opportunities for more data in organizations. And so now insurance technology has caught up far enough where it's becoming a thing, but the employers are saying, hey, by the way, I'm also looking at everything from new back office automation to new ways to sell to new ways to outsource, insource, utilize contractors or distributed networks, mobile applications, video, whatever you name. So you're then just one other thing that's happening in these organizations. And so trying to have people now make it a priority is happening, which is good. We're now in the same conversation as marketing automation, sales automation, HR automation, insure tech automation. This is not part of the conversation too, but you're seeing kind of the choke points on both sides where people are saying, what's really valuable? And there's so many things now that are out there pitching that people are trying to take and adapt solutions that may not be core to insurance and say, oh, this works for insurance too. But I think you're going to kind of see over the next probably two or three years, a couple of things begin to rise to the top as becoming industry category leaders in certain places. We hope we get there. Um, but it's really interesting right now to see both the fire hose of activity that's coming out and people trying to catch up that and figure out all these things that are happening and what's more important. How do I actually have enough information to this? So I want, I want to segue to from your business because I think you touched on something there that I want to scratch itch a little bit more. Um, you started out doing pure tech as an app. Yeah. And then if, if I listen to you deeply, which I did, um, there's, I, I, what I got the sense is that there was a desire from the people you were interacting with. They wanted more, not necessarily more tech, but they wanted more insight. So, um, how much of that actually occurred? So how, like if you know, how, how much of your time, how much of your business time is actually more providing data and insight versus just the, the hard tech of reporting stuff mm -hmm. and how much of that led to like potentially doing consulting. Yeah. Know, where people want you to come in and actually, you know, give solutions. Yeah. It, it's, it's a great question. I get yelled at by my CTO all the time. He says, yeah, consulting for uh, <laughs> but I say, um, but no, it, it, it's this really weird balance, right? So risk management in general is kind of a, consultative teaching type of a function, right? There's a bunch of transactional work involved in it, but it really today um, is a lot of uh, word of mouth, kind of almost storytelling of, hey, here's the things we do because Joe did this before me and Sal did it before her, and here's our process, and here's our form, and here's what we do. And I think a lot of what, what, our, what we we're trying to actually uncover was, um, can I get enough data to be able to say this is important and this is not and here's what people are doing better than you and by the way here are the vendors you should be using and the process you should enforce and so right now I would say of our system we kind of think of it in like three big buckets reporting workflow data right and so what we're seeing is those three things are actually each running both independently and together in all the clients we've installed them into um, which is creating this opportunity where people are coming to us. At first it was we show up and they would say, here's how we do things. They say, perfect, I can do that. And then it was we showed up and they say, well, what do you think about how we should do these things? And so now, even though we're not necessarily in a consulting role, um, we are able to provide data-driven ideas around best practices and more importantly, real-time feedback loops around much bigger population sets than most people can actually see and begin to now actually provide that insight in a meaningful time frame that can allow information sharing in really powerful ways. And I think as you think about kind of where we go from here, one of our biggest opportunities today is we're having a number of conversations with a phenomenal array of vendors from everything from video physical therapy to sensors to manage property to wearables and hard hats to uh, people that will kind of come out in the field and go ahead and take a look at what's happening. And so a lot of what we're trying to do is actually be able to provide those in a structured way at the right point in time and then being able to then step back and say, by the way, 
here is a company who's doing well using these things. Here's a company who's doing really poor using these things. To your point about the fighter jet, can we go ahead and actually figure out which bullet holes take a plane down and which ones don't, and then make sure we add armor in the right places? Um, and if we can do that, then we're actually able to go to the next person and say, hey, by the way, here's what you're doing. Here's what else you should be doing, because our basic goal here is help people make better decisions in real time every time. And if they can do those things, they can keep their employees safe, they can keep their businesses healthier, and candidly, risk management becomes not a pain in your side, but a value-added differentiator that can help companies to actually do better. Yeah, and to me, that's like such a giant leap forward because, um, and, and I see this with a lot of insure techs where it's the tech, mm -hmm. trying to get the tech in. And your, your conversation reminds me of one I had with David Tobias of Betterview, a drone-based company out in California. Um, when, he, when they did their first project, the underwriter was like, oh, well, these are great pictures. What am I supposed to do with them? Yeah. <laughs> right? And the light bulb went off in their head. It was just like, oh, we should, we should probably like, help them like, analyze these things. And that's, you know, when I hear about machine learning and I hear about artificial intelligence, it's like, to me, that's where it really comes in and makes a difference where it's, it's part, uh, partially workflow, as you described, but it's taking the data, the workflow, those pieces, mm -hmm. and streamlining insights, solutions, something that, um, you know, at the end of the day, they can get some kind of ROI on. Yeah, no, I agree. Actually, I was at a dinner with David at ITC. He's uh, he's great. I'm a fan. Yeah, good, awesome. We should we should get a profiles and risk dinner together. I like uh, it with, with everybody. Um, I'll pick up the tab. Hey, by the way, some rotisserie chicken and vegetables. I'm in. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, okay, lessons learned. Um, you you've actually been doing this for quite some time. So you were doing this well before InsureTech was a word. Mm -hmm. um, so lessons learned, um, if you could go back, um, what type, what, I, you know, when people ask me this question, I'm always like, well, you know, I had to go through the hard times to kind of yeah. get to this point. But if there were, if there was like a mistake you made or something that you could go back and just say, I definitely would have done that part over, or I know how to do that part better. What are some of the things that you think would uh, get you over the speed bumps? Yeah. Uh, when you first got started? Yeah, no, I, I think for us, um, th there were a couple. And it's always, we do kind of these 360 reviews every quarter or so, of just what's going on, what do we mess up, where can we be better? Um, I think early on, um, I, I think because we kind of ended up in here in stance, I mean, Kaylee, the first 18 months of this business for us, just like going just far enough till someone else gave us like a, that's a good, a good pat in the back, good job. And we're like, oh, I should keep going. Um, so for the first 18 months, we were kind of just like nights and weekends exploring, seeing what really happened. Um, and the next thing you know, we're like, oh my God, we're having real conversations with like CNA and they want to use us. And they're like, what does that cost? And I'm like, I don't know what it costs. Um, but I, 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 think, I think the first lesson that we would have learned was um, it would have been wonderful to have been sprinting since 2013. That would have been probably, and I, I think an extra two years ahead right now would be incredible. Now that said, easier said than done. You, all the licks you take kind of get you there, blah, blah, blah. But I think that that was one thing. Um, the second big lesson learned here was um, there's this really weird thing that we find in the world of brokerage and risk management that I wish I would have known two years ago because it would have helped to kind of reorient some of our focus. It's going to stop there. I'm just going to no, 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 don't. No. What are you doing? What is it? What is it? What is um, it? <laughs> um, but it, it, it's that half the battle in this space is simply sticking around long enough for someone to realize you're here to help. Um, and by that, what I mean is the first TPA we landed was, I think, end of 2016. Um, we had been to their offices, I believe, every six months for three and a half years. And the first it was, why would you do this? Then it was like, whatever. And then it was like, oh, we already do that. And then it was like, oh, it's interesting. Then it was like, oh, we're going to build this. And then it was like, well, maybe this is interesting. And it's like, oh, you should talk to somebody. And then we got the deal. And so for us, I think part of what we didn't know early on was we just had to get far enough down our product vision to actually let people see what we, what we were trying to do. Because I don't think as many people are able to actually visualize where you're going as the people who are in it every day. 
Um, and so it took us a while to get our product to catch up to our idea. Um, but for us, we kind of had this tenuous couple of years when we were saying we were getting a couple of very positive reinforcements. A lot of people kept saying, eh, I don't know, we'll see. Um, and today, you know, business is thriving. We have a ton of great companies, some of the biggest ones in the world I never thought we'd be talking to her and like having really deep conversations and buying our product. And it blows my mind to think that four years ago, someone told us, we already do that. And now we're at companies 10 times that size that are saying, how do we pilot? Um, so I think the, the other biggest thing that I think we learned here was half of it is just a game of attrition. And sometimes you just have to kind of really trust your gut. Like if you know there's a problem and if you are able to like get the validations, it's not about the people that say no, because it's easier to say no than yes. Just have to kind of have the belief to be able to say like, we're just going to push through. And by the way, knowing that I'm showing up in two years from now and in two years from now, you look at me and say, well, I started building on this idea back in 2016 and you're still going in 2018 with four times the team. Maybe I should take a look. Um, that's the other big thing for us. Yeah. I, I, I just think that's such a valuable piece of advice, um, you know, to, for, for potential entrepreneurs, but those that are starting, um, that's my experience as well. Yeah. Um, you, you hear a lot of no's, you hear a lot of, okay, that's interesting. I, I think, I think there's something about just sticking around that gives, that gives you credibility. Yeah that you know whatever subtle message that sends to the universe that's out there that it's just like these people these guys aren't going away mm -hmm. and they're bringing something valuable so it, to, to me that's um when i have counseled others that are potentially starting i usually tell them um have enough capital have enough stashed away for two years because mm -hmm. you're gonna you're gonna need about that before people will take you seriously i just think that's incredibly valuable advice that you have yeah, no, and it, it still blows my mind how like the single best thing we've ever done for marketing is just staying in business for five years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah the the uh, dealing dealing with brokers can be very interesting, um, mm -hmm. and I I especially like um, so so let's as, as we transition towards the end of the podcast, that's something I want to touch on too because that's something that's come across my desk and something we've been dealing with: mm -hmm. buy versus build. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're a builder. Mm -hmm. You're coming, you're selling into the space. That's something that we struggle with internally, whether we should build it or whether we should buy it. So um, as a builder, as someone that's selling into the space, how, mm -hmm. how do you counsel? How do you overcome that potential objection when someone's saying um, great stuff that you have, but we're going to, we're building it on our own. Um, T talk about the pitfalls of building it on your own. Oh yeah, and it, it is, uh, again, no matter what software company you're in, you'll always find someone who thinks they can build it. Mm -hmm. uh, which is really, it's, a, it's an interesting dilemma. Um, I, I, I think for us, uh, again, part of kind of the longevity here is, you know, five years, a lot of lifestyle lot of lessons learned. We now have gotten far enough where that conversation happens for us at a bigger level deals that are looking at, you know, fortune 500, top 10, 15 brokers will say those things. We always, every once in a while you'll hear this, you know, you hear a 20 person manufacturing company who's like, Oh, I can build this. And we're like, okay, good luck. <laughs> um, uh, but we have a call with this today. I, I think what's really interesting and especially in our space, um, the biggest challenge that companies have in building things that serve the risk management or the insurance function is not core to any business. Um, even brokerage, right? Servicing the accounts on the claims and analytics side, incident management, loss control, isn't core, it's value add. Um, their core is sell product, renew product, upsell more product, bill and collect. Um, in the world of any widget, whether you're Amazon or your Bob's Coffee Shop, your primary thing is move product or move service. And so if you go down the list of the stack of what the business priorities are, it's make sure the lights stay on, it's sell the stuff, it's build the stuff, it's make sure people who are selling and building stuff get paid, it's a hundred other things, and then it's make sure incidents and claims go right. And so for us, what's really interesting is whenever this conversation happens, we like we had the real talk of, with people saying, by the way, where are you at in your IT's priority queue? How many other things are ahead of this? And will this get the love that you think it needs 
to actually get you what you want. And by the way, after all those things have happened, if things change, like you get a new carrier, new OSHA regulations come out, you decide you want to do things differently, then what happens? And how long are you waiting? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think for non-core functions, I'm a huge believer in do your homework, find the best vendors in the space, talk to people you trust. But for non-core business functions, it's generally a really bad idea for companies to build it because once you build it, you need to support it. Mm -hmm. And do you ever ask your IT team to go ahead and do an account management session and say, what's my product roadmap and I have a support question? You'll know that like that doesn't happen. Um, so when people are thinking about building it, there's everything else involved. There's scoping the product, there's building it, there's servicing it, there's training people on how to use it. When you go to a third party, you get all those things because that's all they do. Um, and I think as long as you kind of have your security buckets checked and you have your functionality buckets checked and you have your references checked, that you actually have in a position if you find the right set of vendors where you get everything you want, it costs nowhere near as much as it costs when you have everything that's going to be required to build something internally and you get it right away. So I'm, I'm in our space a huge believer of the buy, uh, sorry, of the buy us versus build. <laughs> Make sure I said that right. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, it's, it's always a really interesting conversation, but I think, you know, more and more, especially once people have like the real conversation of like, where does risk management sit in development's priority queue? And you ask them, well, what's ahead of it? They start to say, oh, maybe I should look at working with someone. Well, I, I can tell you from working on the carrier side, um, I've built stuff. Yeah. I've been responsible for building stuff and uh, two things that one that you mentioned was uh, we gave very little consideration to maintaining it. Um, it was an afterthought. It was like, well, once we build it, it's going to be easy to maintain. It was a lot, it was a lot more difficult to maintain. Um, and uh, the, the time, the, um, the effort to build it, it um, you end up building something that's below what you were dreaming of mm -hmm. anyways, you know, because there are time pressures and other things. So it's always more expensive, uh, both in the short term and the long term. Um, I can't think of something that we built internally that wouldn't have been better off if we had just outsourced it. Yeah. Well, I think the really interesting thing that we saw happen in the carrier TPA and broker space was about 2000 and three, four, five, all the way through eight, nine, ten. 10. Um, there was this huge movement of like, we're going to build everything internally. Um, and they took all of these huge projects underway at a ton of, you know, big carriers, big brokers, big TPAs, built all these systems. And it's amazing how many of those have just been zombied or ghosted right now. And I, I think there's actually some fundamental issues with the way carriers are set up and technologies and their TPAs and brokers, basically every step of the organization, a carrier is designed to reduce and avoid risk. That's their business, right? It's designed to say, I don't want to underwrite things that aren't profitable. I don't want to pay and try and find claims that are going to blow up in our face. I don't want to go into new businesses because our goal is get the premiums, get the money, don't pay out too much and you're good to you grow a great business. In that mindset, trying to marry that up with technology which by itself is basically like let's slap on some code and figure out if these things actually work where people make their lives better requires so much trial and error and so much margin of error that you often when things happening at provision at a carrier level tpa level broker level there's so many different hands in the cookie jar around legal compliance making sure everything is safe and, and everything everyone's voice is heard and although people's voices should be heard it's really hard to collaboratively in a group of that side build something that solves a singular problem really well, or even a small set of things really well. So I think your, your point is 100% is spot on in that it's been really hard for people in this space to build things. And if they could go back 2003 and say, versus the $100 million I'm going to spend on some of these projects over the next 10 years, if I just put a couple of good partners to work with, would I be in a better spot? I bet 80% would say yes. Other 20% would be lying through their teeth to keep their dream. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's, what's the future hold for a claimant? Um, yeah. where, where do you, where do you see this going? Where do you see you going? Yeah. So, um, hopefully the more bigger and better. I think our team grew about three times this year. Um, hopefully we're about a hundred people or so sometime mm -hmm. towards the end of next year, early the following, um, 
we've been incredibly fortunate to find a ton of, uh, of good partners in places like staffing and construction, hospitality. We have some of the biggest companies in the world that are kind of gearing up to come on board Q1, Q2. So I think for us, it's going to be just heads down and candidly run like hell. Um, and our goal here is hopefully we're staying uh, based in Chicago. We'll be getting bigger and more offices, hiring a bunch of great people, and just trying to find good companies to work with. Awesome. Awesome. I love that. Yeah. Uh, this is the this is the portion of the podcast we transition over and ask a couple of personal questions. Nice. Um, it's mostly for me to just because I'm lazy and I want to piggyback off of your answers. So, uh, first one is: Do you use any tools or technology that make you that you find that make you productive and or organized? Yes. <laughs> our okay. whole our whole company. So we are built right now. Um, on, uh, we have a U.S. remote team, so we do flex. Um, so we have about 18 or so in Chicago and the rest of the people are across the U.S. In order to maintain that, we are on Slack, Trello, Salesforce, and Zoom almost all day, every day. Um, and so at any point in time, there's probably a dozen Slack conversations going. There's at least six or seven Zoom meeting rooms that are being utilized um, and so on. Um, Although what's weird is the single place that I spend most of my time, this is depressing, um, is Gmail. Um, I feel like I'm a professional emailer, but the only thing that helps me get through day to day is literally in a meeting, I will draft up the email that is the follow-up to that meeting as my notes. So versus like trying to take notes somewhere else, my life hack is I draft up the actual meeting notes, follow-ups all in the actual meeting itself. When the meeting is over, hit send, so it's done and I'm on to the next thing. Um, cause if not, I don't get back to it for a week. And at that point in time, I have no idea what the conversation was about. Mm. Happens to me all the time. Right. All the time. Uh, <laughs> Slack, yeah, so Trello, Salesforce, Zoom. I know all of those, uh, good choices. I'll put links to those so people can get those. Uh, if they, if they want to, uh, be lazy like me and just click on links and not write things down while they're <laughs> driving, listening to this, uh, final question is, uh, books. What yeah. books have you found to be influential in your business and or personal lives? Anything? Yeah. So it's funny. You sent this email over. I started scrambling and I was going to make up something. Um, so we have, uh, I have two kids uh, under two and a half. Um, and my third kid is the business. Um, so I honestly haven't had time to read a book in about four or five years, which is super depressing. And I'm really not. Yeah, I completely get it. I'm in the same boat. Yeah, but that said, um, the last handful of books I read before that, um, uh, all the Gladwell stuff I found very interesting. So you can imagine last time I read a book was when Gladwell was just coming out. So that's for perspective. Um, and then the second set of things was um, there was a really interesting book. Um, I believe it was called Founder Stories um, that basically took an in-depth look at, um, I think it was 10 to 15 different founders um, at very large and very small companies that have been both super successful and horribly failed um, and kind of just walked through their actual perspectives and their lives and their stories. And for me, what was really interesting was, you know, from the outside coming in, I came into entrepreneurship from venture. So I kind of saw the outside and had a sense for what was happening. But when you're actually in this every single day, the highs are higher, the lows are lower. Sometimes you like stare into a, like, the abyss and you think well, what's going on. And sometimes you feel like Superman and you're like, I could run through a wall right now and nothing could stop me. Um, and just understanding that these things aren't linear. You're not guaranteed to succeed, nor are you guaranteed to fail. Um, and sometimes just having that perspective to figure out how people like literally were faced with an impossible situation. Um, I'm sure over dramatized for the book. Um, but like, came out around it has been super interesting to see uh, because it's amazing how many parallels you'll find like in our day-to-day -day lives. You're sitting there like, I don't know what we do here. I'm like, well, what about, you're like, I didn't even think about that. We should do this. And you go on from there. Um, man, that, that like that struck a chord with me, what you just said, because th there are days where I'm staring at my screen and I got a ton of work to do and I get nothing done. I'm just like staring at my screen, not know, not even knowing, like, I don't even know what to work on. Like there's so many fires to put out. I don't even know which one's the most important. It's just uh, so stressful. And then there are other days it's just like, yeah, <laughs> this is awesome. This is, we're going to be so successful. Warren Buffett, watch out. Yeah. Um, Actually, it's yeah. funny. There was, um, 
Uh, one of the, the, the people who invested in us um, has a portfolio as a company um, that one of the guys runs based out of Palo Alto. And I think um, he started a podcast called No One's Crushing It. Um, uh, and basically premise was if you ask any startup founder, you know, they don't know you and you say, how you, how's the business going? Like, oh, I'm crushing it. Uh, the reality is, no one's crushing it. Yeah. These, these things are slogs and they're grinds. And even companies that are blowing up have so many internal problems and, and challenges that it's, it's ne- honestly, I've never had more fun in my entire life. But to say this is easy and everyone should do it would be an outright lie. Yeah. Uh, I think it takes a sick person to do what we do. Um, but for those who actually have the disease, it's, it's the best medicine. Yeah. I, I, to be honest, if I had to do this over again, I'm not sure. <laughs> right. If someone told you what you're getting into, you'd be like, really? I'm yeah. going to wake up at six and I'm going to work until midnight and I'm going to be in bed before I go to bed being like, ah, oh, what's that proposal? Should that be 10,000? Yeah. yeah. hundred percent. I'm right there with you. <laughs> yeah. There's uh there's more work than can be done. Like the, it's, it's literally impossible to get everything done. And so uh, unfortunately, like I, I wouldn't say I was a perfectionist um, by far, but you know, I do have some pride in my, my work product mm-hmm. and I've, I've had to really lower that. <laughs> I've, I've had to give up on, you know, sending anything out that I'm even like proud of. It's, it's just not possible. Like you just have to pick and choose your battles. Done is better than good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, this was awesome. Great conversation. Uh, I appreciate you taking time out on uh, Friday afternoon. And uh, I guess now it's time for rotisserie chicken and potatoes. Yeah, wait, I'm getting some pizza and some pasta at Italy in Chicago. It's going to be delicious. Deep Can't dish? Uh, now we're going, we're going Sicilian style. Okay. I, a quick, quick story on the deep dish. Um, the first time I had deep dish, I was doing a presentation to Aeon. <laughs> and I was to speak right after lunch. God. And I, it was delicious. I, I oh, ate God. one and I'm like, oh, this is really good. It was August. And then I ate another and I might as well have eaten a cinder block <laughs> because I was sweating so profusely. Everyone in the audience was like horrified at how I, I was so uncomfortable. Like I just, I could not digest my food. It was hot. I was a soaking sweaty mess. That's my introduction to deep dish pizza. I think the rough math on Chicago pizza deep dish is it's, it's roughly one stick of butter per slice. <laughs> um, for those that aren't familiar with the Midwest, so if you want to do the yeah. Yikes. Uh, <laughs> never again. Now never. I know when I have deep, deep dish, I'm limited to one piece. Exactly. And, and I have to speak last or early in the morning. So yes. that's the deal. Uh, my guest this week has been David Wald of of A. Clayman. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it.